<laughs> but this whole thing, it's just a symptom of a larger problem. There's a growing anti-intellectual strain in this country. That many, that it may be the beginning of the end of our informed democracy. <laughs> of course, in a free society, you can and should think whatever you want. And if you want to think the world is flat, go right ahead. The Earth isn't flat. <laughs> and by the way, this is called gravity. It is an interesting experiment telling somebody you know that you no longer believe in the universe and that our Earth is a giant spinning space ball. Try it for yourself. I guarantee they will tell you you're crazy or at least look at you like you've lost your mind. The most interesting thing is when challenged, the ball believers will not actually be able to give you solid empirical evidence based on their first hand experience that the Earth is actually a large spinning globe. Can any of us demonstrate firsthand in our day to day lives the Earth's curve or motion through the solar system? No, we cannot. And can any of us say we have seen the planets in their orbit and the universe expanding with our own eyes? No, again, we can't. Usually in response to this crazy person telling them that the Earth is flat, they will respond by 1. Bringing up images of the Earth as presented by NASA or 2. They will say, come on, everyone knows space exists and tell you that countless professors have dedicated their lives to studying this matter. At some point, perhaps, an emphasis on the existence of gravity will come up in the conversation. But you see, what is really happening when someone reacts so stubbornly to an alternative view of the Earth is not a result of the person's mental capacity. If the person had sat down with their heavily pregnant sister and said, you are not a woman and you are not pregnant, then that is a statement which deserves such a reaction as there is obvious empirical evidence of her pregnancy. No, what commences when challenging a person on the Earth is a battle against their programming. This programming is a deep-rooted and established matrix that is deliberately constructed when we are infants. Before we leave primary school, our first-hand experience of our flat and stationary world is slowly being erased and steadily inflating into the bloated and spherical idea that the Earth is a globe. The sad thing is, many of us grow up and never question this notion again. It is only in photographs and videos from NASA and other official trusted sources that the horizon appears curved. All amateur and raw unedited images of the Earth will provide a completely flat horizon. And this is what we see ourselves through our own two eyes when standing at a beach or looking out from a vantage point. At any altitude, the horizon always appears 360 degrees flat, because it is. And it always rises to meet the eye level of the viewer. You never have to look down or up to see the horizon. It meets you. No matter how huge they say the Earth is, if it were a curved ball, you would have to adjust your view upwards or downwards to meet the horizon. And I know we've seen the curve in photos and videos, but NASA and many other official sources continually distort the horizon in their footage with a fisheye lens to give the effect of a curved Earth. This is the same fisheye lens inherently built into the GoPro. And I know what you're going to say. You've seen the horizon bend and curve when journeying at altitude on an aeroplane. But unfortunately, this is more trickery. Aeroplane windows commonly bow outwards to give the illusion of curvature. A Telegraph article, catering to our gullible nature, explains that flight windows were changed because the square windows caused a higher percentage of crashes. Yeah, right. They use our size as human beings to dismiss our own infallible perception of a flat and stationary Earth, claiming we are not big enough to witness the curvature. But this balloon managed to ascend 121,000 feet and left its fisheye lens behind. Lo and behold, a flat horizon. The balloon wobbles and spins but the horizon remains dead straight, not curving in any way, shape or form. And this is the problem. 
For centuries, our ancestors used their own judgment and relied on their own natural-born senses to discern that the Earth was flat. And although some had dabbled in theories of the Earth's potential curvature, it wasn't until the early modern period, with voyages like Christopher Columbus, that the heliocentric globe model became dominant and humans forever sacrificed the knowledge of their own senses. And the heliocentric model is so blatantly flawed and nonsensical that it's astonishing that it even gained traction. Take the water bordering our horizon, for instance. It is the natural physics of water to find and maintain a level. And it just so happens that that level is flat. If Earth was a spherical ball, water would not maintain such consistent flat levels. We are used to water doing this. And this. But we have never, in all our lives on Earth, witnessed with our own eyes water do this. Water does not bend. It's not called sea level for nothing, you know. And if water did not always find a flat level, then why would we use tools such as this to achieve accuracy? Again, water does not bend. Rivers, for instance, always run down to sea level. If Earth was a rotating ball, then inevitably many rivers on Earth would, at some point in their journey, have to flow uphill. As Eric DeBay points out, the Mississippi is 3,000 miles long, which means it would need to run uphill for 11 miles on a globular Earth. He also points out that a portion of the Nile runs for 1,000 miles with a fall of only one foot. Again, if the Earth was a spherical ball, this would be impossible. The scientist magicians of our world claim that the Earth is 25,000 miles in circumference. But spherical trigonometry dictates that the surface of all standing water must curve downward at 8 inches per mile, multiplied by the square of the distance. That means that a 20 mile stretch of water would dip 66.68 feet on either side of its central peak. Every time scientists have tried to find these dips and bends, however, water always proves to be completely level and flat. There's a growing anti-intellectual strain in this country. When building railway tracks, roads and bridges, Architects and engineers never account for any curvature. Engineer W. Winkler was published in the Earth Review regarding the Earth's supposed curvature, stating, As an engineer of many years standing, I saw that this absurd allowance is only permitted in school books. No engineer would dream of allowing anything of the kind. I have projected many miles of railways and many more of canals, and the allowance has not even been thought of, much less allowed for. This allowance for curvature means this, that it is 8 inches for the first mile of a canal, and increasing at a ratio by the square of the distance in miles. Thus a small navigable canal for boats, say 30 miles long, will have, by the above rule, an allowance for curvature of 600 feet. Think of that, and then please credit engineers as not being quite such fools. Nothing of the sort is allowed. We no more think of allowing 600 feet for a line of 30 miles of railway or canal than of wasting our time trying to square the circle. There's a growing anti-intellectual strain in this country. If the Earth was actually a globe, spinning at a mind-numbing 1,000 miles per hour, how is it that we do not feel its motion? There is not a single person on Earth that can testify to feeling the Earth's alleged spin. We feel the motion when traveling in a car, train, boat, plane, and can experience motion sickness. The scientists' magicians will tell you that we do not feel the Earth spin because it is spinning at a constant speed. They often use the analogy of a train ride, we only feel that we are moving when the train changes speed. 
This analogy, however, falls apart when you consider that in the heliocentric model, the Earth is not an enclosed system, but it is an open environment with its own drastically changing weather. If you were sitting on top of the train moving at a constant speed, and not inside it, you would certainly feel the motion. Furthermore, they also contradict themselves. In a 2016 article titled, NASA study solves two mysteries about wobbling Earth. They state that the Earth does not always spin on an axis. Instead, it wobbles irregularly over time and that the direction has changed drastically due to changes in water mass on Earth. It's weird that no one has felt this. Which one is it, NASA? The stealthy, unnoticeable spin or irregular movement patterns and wobbles? The whole notion of a spinning globe becomes absurd when you consider this. If the Earth was actually rotating, then helicopters and balloons would only need to hover over the surface and wait for their destination to come to them. Similarly, if it were a curved space ball, then aeroplane pilots would constantly need to readjust their altitude downwards so they did not continue straight and start heading out to space. They would have to descend 2,777 feet or over half a mile every single minute. This of course is not the case and pilots are never instructed or taught this mechanism of flight. And what does a real pilot have to say about it? Oh, okay. Am I allowed to say hi? Uh, Hey guys, I just want to say thanks for the smooth flight. Alright. I have, did, have one question. Is there like a specific angle of downward tilt you have to fly at? To three degrees. Three degrees for the curvature of the Earth? Oh, for the Earth? Because... Yeah. No, we just fly over over the troposphere. Really? Yeah, but yeah. Do you have to keep like kind of going down because... No. We actually have to lose up. It, it flies... Yeah. Really? Because I was reading some stuff on the flat earth that made a lot of sense. Have you looked into it? Which one? Which one? Sorry. On the, I was reading a lot of stuff on the flat earth. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. True, true. It's true? Yeah. Okay, yeah. alright, cool. All right. Hey, God bless, brother. Alright, have a good one. You too. Crack on. I just got one question to ask. Flat or a ball? Flat or a ball? What's that? Well, I never feel as breaking round. If we live on a ball, surely we'd have to fly around it? Yeah, it uh, feels like. Flat or a ball? It's flat, not a ball. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's flat. It's yeah, flat. me too. It's flat to me. It on. certainly does, doesn't it? And you, you, you've got that flight instrument yeah, down there to keep gravity it flat. Gravity exists. Gravity? Yeah, these are an unproven theory. No, it's not. <laughs> Let's rock and roll. Cheers, fellas. Thank, Thank you very much for the. Can I ask the pilots one question? Ah, oh, the first officer's here. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Got a for you. Oh, yeah. Hello mate, how are you? Yeah, good. Um, I'm a fellow, uh, Casey Josh, I'm a fellow, just PPL, oh, hello, pilot, cool. yeah. Yeah, nice. I've got a couple of serious questions to ask yeah. you. Okay, here we go. Yeah, there's a big time. <laughs> curvature. Curvature? Yeah. Yeah. We don't allow for curvature, do we? Yeah, for anything, not for you usually. Yeah. No, we're, we're round, we're a disc, aren't we? Oh, round and flat. Yeah. Sorry. Hey, right. look, honestly, Quite seriously? Yeah. We are, aren't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, mate. Thank you for being... If the Earth is actually rotating, flight paths would become very messy. Flying west from New York to California is 2,441 miles, which takes just under five hours on a commercial flight. If the Earth is spinning eastwards at 1,000 miles per hour, then not only would this flight take a lot less time, but it would also make it near impossible to fly back the other way due to the constant rotation of the Earth. It would be like trying to run up a very long and very fast downward escalator. And what about the weather? If the Earth and atmosphere is spinning at a thousand miles per hour, then don't you think it would be impossible to see such stationary clouds and weather formations like we do? Not to mention that clouds often crisscross in their pathways. This would be impossible if the Earth's spin was a reality. Thomas Winship states, Let imagination picture to the mind what force air would have which was set in motion by a spherical body of 8,000 miles in diameter. 
which in one hour was spinning around 1,000 miles per hour, rushing through space at 65,000 miles per hour and gyrating across the heavens. Then let conjecture endeavour to discover whether the inhabitants on such a globe could keep their hair on. If the Earth globe rotates on its axis at a terrific rate of 1,000 miles an hour, such an immense mass would of necessity cause a tremendous rush of wind in the space it occupied. The wind would go all one way and anything like clouds which got within the sphere of influence of the rotating sphere would have to go the same way. The fact that the Earth is at rest is proved by kite flying. And honestly, if the Earth was a fast rotating globe, then wouldn't the oceans and other bodies of water be pushed away from the Earth in the same way as when a wet tennis ball is spun rapidly, the water sprays outwards? The scientist magicians have an answer for this. They call it gravity. And by the way, this is called gravity. The scientist magicians are at it again weaving their spells and telling us tales of a powerful force keeping us rooted to the earth. If gravity was such a powerhouse, then birds would struggle to fly. Insects would not be able to use wind to navigate. Monkeys would not climb and jump among trees with ease. Planes would not be able to take off from the ground. Trees would not be able to overcome gravity's pull when their growth towards sunlight and would begin to bend towards the earth the taller they became. And, if gravity exists and has the power to bend and wrap the oceans around a gigantic spinning ball, then humans would certainly struggle to lift their arms and legs. Legend has it that an apple fell on Newton's head as he sat under the tree, and this was the catalyst for his great discovery of gravity, which claims that objects are attracted to large masses and gravitate towards their centre. However, when they talk about gravity, what they are actually referring to is the law of density relative to mass. Today, I'm going to show you a simple science experiment that you can try at home to learn about density. Start by taking an empty glass and tip in some water and food colouring. Then add some syrup or treacle. And I'm going to add a little bit more water to make the layer a bit thicker. Then finally, fill the glass up with some oil and leave it to settle for about 15 minutes. These liquids separate out into different layers because they're different densities and they don't mix. The syrup has the highest density so it sits on the bottom and the oil, which has the lowest density, rises to the top. Try dropping different objects in to see what happens. If we drop this metal nut in, which is really dense, you can see it sinks right to the bottom. But if I take this grape and drop it in, it sinks through the oil and water, but sits on the syrup. This is because the syrup is denser than the grape. Pretty cool, huh? Now if I take this plastic bottle top and drop it in, it slowly sinks through the oil and sits on the water. And finally, if I take this piece of sponge and drop it in, it sits on top. It is a scientific fact, verified by undisputable evidence, that when objects are placed in mediums with less density, they sink, and when placed in mediums with higher density, they rise or float. For example, a rock in water will sink because the object's density is greater than the water's density, as will a ship's anchor. Likewise, helium-filled balloons rise because they are lighter than the air. Submarines float on the ocean when their ballast tanks are empty, and contain air, and they sink when their ballast tanks begin to be filled with water. This is how they manipulate their depth in the ocean, by adjusting the ratio of air and water in the tanks. This is proven by filling a balloon with 50% air and 50% helium. As helium is lighter than air, and the ratios are even, the balloon remains fixed in the air without rising or falling. Again, much like the Earth's curve and spin, we do not witness smaller objects on Earth gravitating and orbiting around or being pulled towards larger objects. It seems very convenient that gravity's tendency to make smaller objects orbit around larger objects is exclusive to the globe itself and all the supposedly surrounding planets and stars, none of which we can actually see in motion or orbit. 
Even when you study the claims made by the scientists magicians of the so-called planets and moons, their calculations begin to work against them. As Eric Debay pointed out, Newton also theorized, and it is now commonly taught, that the Earth's ocean tides are caused by gravitational lunar attraction. If the Moon is only 2,160 miles in diameter and the Earth 8,000 miles, however, using their own math and law, it follows that the Earth is 87 times more massive and therefore the larger object should attract the smaller to it and not the other way around. If the Earth's greater gravity is what keeps the Moon in orbit, it is impossible for the Moon's lesser gravity to supersede the Earth's gravity, especially at Earth's sea level, where its gravitational attraction would even further out-trump the Moon's. And if the Moon's gravity truly did supersede the Earth's calls in the tide to be drawn towards it, there should be nothing to stop them from continuing onwards and upwards towards their greater attractor. Anti-intellectual strain in this country. Ultimately, Newton's gravity arrays the common sense of up and down and in its place normalize the preposterous idea that this is possible. And this. And that meanwhile, in Australia, this is nonsensical, pseudo-scientific mockery and nothing more than an invention to justify the spinning spherical Earth hoax. Without the theory of gravity, not a single person in their right minds would ever believe the Earth a globe, with some of the population existing upside down on the underside of the planet. This is all quite simple once you start to break away from the toddler years of Matrix programming. The laws of perspective and density perfectly explain the natural workings of our world. They invent complex concepts such as gravity and ridiculous spinning spherical networks of incomprehensible figures and speeds to bamboozle us. And we will get onto why they do this shortly. But wait a minute, I know you're not on board with this just yet and I can tell you have a big question that you're burning to ask. If the Earth is not a spinning globe, then what about the Sun and the Moon? We can see the Sun rising and setting every day. Ah, I'm glad you asked. Follow me to part 4 so we can take a much closer look at our wonderful Sun.